So, hello everybody. I was Jake, just waking up this morning, twisting my head a little bit. That's maybe the reason why I walk a little bit like a robot. So it's not part of the show, it's just the twisted neck. So we are Gemma this, and we design a chip that works like the human brain. I'm pretty sure you guys know all about the amazing opportunities that arise from the use of AI today, and that are gonna arise from the use of AI in, in some years. And I'm like a really tech positive person because I think that we are going to need these innovations that will come from AI to solve the really big problems that we are facing in the future. However, I have bad news for, for you today because there is a problem with the current AI technology and the current AI hardware because AI, AI hardware is way too inefficient to operate. Okay, the slides are not moving so I have to do it without slides. Um, as you see, ChatGPT is consuming more than 100 million US dollar every, every month for operation costs for its servers because the energy requirements of the hardware are way too high. Or if you look at Tesla, the newly developed Dojo chip is taking more than 30 days for one single training cycle. It means you gather all the data, you feed them into the system, and then you have to wait more than 30 days while consuming tons of energy until the training is done. Afterwards, you can look at your neural network and see if it was fruitful or not. And if it's not fruitful, you have to re-engineer this. And that's the reason for this is that there is a separation in the architecture today between the CPU, the information processing entity, and the RAM, the storage. And this separation between, oh no, there are the slides? No. This separation between both entities leads to a communication bottleneck because both entities have to communicate all the time with each other. And the most of the time and energy within the processing for the neural red networks is going to the actual um, communication and not the processing itself. You can think of it like driving to work six hours a day for just a two hours work day. There you see that the most of the time and the energy you, are, you afford is for the driving and not the actual work during the two hours. So, there it is, perfect. So, you see on the left side the separation and now we come to the right side. So, what we do at Gemavis is we use a novel component called a memristors to adopt the information processing mechanism of the human brain. Because the human brain is like a natural blueprint. It is very, very intelligent and um, it is only running on the energy of a light bulb. By using the memristor, the memristor can store and process information in the exact same place, and we build neurons and synapses in a very abstract way to adapt this information processing mechanism. You can think of how people developed the plane years ago. They looked at the bird, and they looked at it, how it flies around, and then they were trying to adapt the mechanisms that it uses. So if you look at planes today, they don't look really like birds, but you can see some coexistences. So for example, they have wings. And with this, with this example, you can think a little bit of how we do it when we look at the brain and try to adapt these mechanisms for our hardware. So our product is an AI chip that is 100 times faster and 100 times more energy efficient than state-of-the-art technology, adding up to a 10,000 times reduced energy consumption overall. Because we use standard processing mechanisms with CMOS production lines, we are as cheap as a chip in a smartphone, and because our chip is really, really small and very energy efficient, we can nearly build it into every mobile device, enabling decentralized AI training on my smartwatch, on your mobile phone, or on any sensor you could think of. So our vision is that there will be, will be a future when every processor on every device will come with a Gemesis AI chip. And why is this important, or why do we think that is changing something because what you do and what you all have probably at the moment is you have a smartphone with a Siri so if you have an Apple it's a Siri on it and the Siri you're talking to is exactly the same Siri as my Siri because how we do it today is we we gather all the data on all mobile devices send them to a centralized place where the neural network is trained and then we deploy them on every small smartphone so your Siri is just a mean of all data gathered everywhere but Actually, and that's for me is sometimes a little bit funny, or smartphones are not smartphones. I would rather th call them stupid phones because they are just 
everywhere the same. So I want my smartphone to understand me. I want to understand my German sarcasm and maybe my German accent. So with Orchip, this will be possible because we can really train neural networks on devices. So to push our chip into the market, we license it together with semiconductor manufacturers, and they help us to push it into different market applications. For us, there are two income streams, and a license fee and the per chip royalty. The per chip royalty goes to the company every time a chip is produced with our architecture. Um, you can think of it like having, a smart, uh, having um, Samsung, and they want to build a new TV. And within this TV, they want to have like an AI model that's able to learn. So they can go to the semiconductor manufacturer, ask them to buy or um, chip design, and then it will be integrated in their devices. So they have a better product, the semiconductor manufacturer had better sales, and we get money for every chip produced. So, so far, we have quite great traction. And we draw up on more than 50 years of research on our research institute back in Bochum in Germany. And um, we are now funded with more than 3 million euro uh, non-dilutive by the German government, where we were able to build up a team of approximately 15 people and eight people full time. And one year ago, we were able to finish our first simulation of our chip design to prove that the theoretical aspects behind it are really working. And one month ago, we were able to build the first neurons and synapses in hardware to really replicate what we did in the simulation. Next part will be to really build the first IC chip uh, in the semiconductor manufacturing line and then start scaling it up from there. I think we are at the right time, at the right place, with the right idea, because Europe is heavily demanding more chip design from its own, uh, from its own countries. Because as you see at the moment, they are just 2% of it. And as we see at the moment, there are many, many programs pushing AI and semiconductor startups within this place. So we have a great place for funding. We have a strong team. So there are two of my co-founders, Dennis and Enver. And they got the background uh, of Bayer-inspired computing. And they were developing this idea, this chip design, during their PhDs. Um, then we have Daniel Krueger, I think he's over there today, so if you want to talk to him, you're, you can just come around. Um, and he's an IC de engineer, he has experience from the Harvard University and worked for a brain implant startup. I myself, I'm a former management consultant, I'm responsible for all the non-technical stuff. We have a quite great team of advisors where I really like to highlight Jamie Urquhart. Jamie Urquhart was a co-founder of ARM, and he was able to bring ARM to one of the 200 most valuable companies in the world in adapting the same business model as we do. So we are here today because we're going to raise our first seed round by beginning of next year. So if an investor come around, talk to me, talk to Daniel. And yeah, if, you, if you're a company wanting to use our chip in the future, just come around or drop me a message on LinkedIn. We are Gemesis, and we design a chip that works like the human brain. Thank you.